if you uh, want to pass it on to any of your colleagues, you can do that as well going forward. So, um, well, welcome today. Appreciate everybody sharing part of your Thursday. Thursday here between the holidays. I'm sure everything's very busy. Uh, but our webinar today, sponsored by Trend Data, is driving financial results from people analytics. Um, what I'm going to do is give you just a brief agenda of what we're going to cover <clears throat> and then go um, uh, into a demonstration. But what I'd like to give you just brief on the surface is uh, first of all, tell you who we are, Trend Data. Um, and then go into kind of the meat of the presentation, uh, talk a little bit about the struggles. Um, HR and most departments face and trying to get budget for their solutions and also um, trying to make those impactful. Uh, we'll cite some key weight workforce metrics uh, that can be uh, that uh, very important for organizations to track uh, both from personnel but also from effect on bottom line in both savings and revenue production. Um, uh, and then we'll quantify that return on investment. Uh, another section we've added to the presentation will talk about um, the boost you get from artificial intelligence running on any solution trying to tackle these key um, items. Uh, then we'll do a brief demonstration and uh, take any questions. We did get a few ahead of time uh, from people who registered for the webinar, so we'll cover those as well. Um, my name is Tom McEwen. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Trend Data, so I'm doing the webinar today. Um, nice to meet all of you. So a little bit about Trend Data. Uh, Trend Data is um, based in uh, Plano, Texas. Actually, uh, we've uh, recently moved to Richardson, Texas. Uh, both are northern suburbs of Dallas, so pretty much you fly into Dallas to get here. Um, we launched our company in 2017 uh, and put our first product on the market uh, in October of 2017. We sell largely to corporate clients, uh, but really anybody who has a uh, a workforce, so that could be public institutions, nonprofits, uh, and uh, other types of organizations. Our solution is um, AI-driven people analytics, and it is a cloud SaaS offering, so all you really need to do to access the solution is a browser. Here's just some of our clients that we have um, uh, that have our offerings. Uh, these aren't all of them, but just uh, try to put a representative amount up there. As you see, we uh, go across pretty much all um, uh, we have. Um, healthcare, finance, uh, trucking, manufacturing, retail, technology, whatever. If you're looking to move forward with trend data, we can give you some clients in your space to talk to. But let's talk about um, the subject matter that we're here to, talk, to cover and start out with uh, some data recently published by KPMG, um, which tracks company intentions uh, in 2018. Uh, through from 2014 as to uh, what uh, companies are doing for uh, HR budgeting. As you can see, um, 2014 was somewhat the uh, end of the, uh, the recession and uh, companies were just coming out and starting to uh, uh, move into spending more money. In 2014, 58% uh, of companies plan to decrease their spending uh, on HR technology. And in 2018, uh, we have uh, only 14% of companies that are doing that, um, which is the light blue line. If you look at the purple line, <clears throat> which is companies that tend to keep their changes from uh, their budgets from last year unchanged, that's been on a somewhat of a steady increase. And same thing for those that plan to increase their spending. So the majority, um, uh, the 39 and the 47 uh, is uh, companies that are planning on either keeping the same um, as last year's spending or increasing. So um, uh, uh, companies still doing well financially and looking to invest in their people and their technologies. Now, with that in mind, that kind of leads into this next slide where I talk about some of the key metrics that um, uh, organizations use and uh, how they try and sell the solution up the, up the value chain to the C-suite to get um, to show the value of their systems. So when you look at the different type of metrics out there, I kind of break them into two categories. One that shows results of what's going on in the organization. Um, you know, recruiting, where are you getting your people from, um, uh, 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 how long it takes to bring them on board, um, performance, how are they doing once they're on board, um, in the various stages from uh, once they're trained to once they're seasoned to once possibly they're looking at moving up the, the organization. And then a very big one, uh, particularly in this climate, is retention, okay? You know, you go through all that uh, effort to recruit good people, 
train them so that they're performing well. You don't want them walking out the door and bringing those uh, skill sets to other clients, other um, uh, competitors. Now, when you're looking at that, uh, you can kind of look at the second batch of metrics, which um, talks about investments, things that the company is putting into people. Um, you know, the biggest one is, of course, compensation, which can generally be anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of a company's uh, people expenses, uh, whether it's in salary or bonuses or benefits, whatever. Of course, you spend money on training, uh, trying uh, to put money into culture to get a good work life balance so that people want to um, stay with the company. And then, of course, uh, the investments in technology that will help automate all of this. Now, the question or the, the challenge is often, um, you know, when you want to do these investments, uh, how can you make it so that it's not just looking like an expense to the CFO or the CFO? Um, they don't want to uh, just allot money that's not going to get a return on it. And unfortunately, HR has often had that, that burden to overcome where they're uh, um, looked at, okay, we're going to give them this much this money this year. Um, but uh, don't really see the return on it because uh, it's not a hard dollar, it's more in a uh, soft dollar. So what HR has to do is to be able to tie those things such as compensation, uh, training, uh, retention uh, uh, strategies, all of that, tie all of these investments to these re results and show that by putting that money in, you actually are improving the quality of people you're bringing on board, bringing them up to speed and keeping them on board is turning in um, to help the company uh, sell more, um, cut down expenses and uh, general overall and improve the prospects of the company. I always like to use a, a metric like this, um, which talks about what's the average revenue per employee by company, which is pretty much, this is pretty much a top down statistic. It's just basically the revenues of the company divided by how many employees they are. Uh, there's a couple of different uh, organizations out there that provide this type of data. Uh, this one came from a, a combination study from a group called Priceonics and uh, SHRM, the Society of Human Resource Managers, uh, uh, produced this. I was looking for one from either 2017 or 2018, but then wasn't able to find a, a more current one. But this is probably at least accurate for the um, exercise we're going to look at here in a few minutes. But if you take the things that uh, you look at the, um, you know, the average revenue per employee, you know, down on the low end, you've got in the industrials, it's 321,000 uh, uh, per employee to the high end in healthcare and energy, where it's, you know, pretty astronomical, the return on investment you get for an individual employee. And then when you look at some of the um, statistics on uh, uh, what it takes to bring people on board, you look at the average cost per hire uh, across industries is uh, not too expensive when you look at those, uh, those, uh, those uh, numbers. So it's only 4000 $4,200 uh, per hire. Now that's just basically the amount of technology and um, uh, uh, recruiting man hours it takes to bring someone on board. Uh, the average time to fill an open position today is still about 42 days. Uh, companies are trying to cut that down mainly because uh, the recruiting process is so uh, competitive right now. Often you, you get someone stolen away two thirds of the way into the process. The companies are starting to make offers even earlier to make sure that they don't lose candidates sticking to the book too much. Um, and still a very alarming statistic is that 33% of new hires leave the company they sign on with within six months. Uh, so that's a, an alarming trend uh, for anybody who's spending uh, resources trying to bring good candidates on board. Um, from a performance standpoint, this I thought was an interesting stat. It's, it's been around for a while. I don't know if any of you have followed this um, uh, particular individual, Dr. John Sullivan. At Google him. He does a lot of good um, uh, studies on HR and personnel um, and why people leave and why they don't. He also does some good calculations. In this one, for example, uh, his um, study of companies has deemed that uh, the average high performer, you know, the top people in your organizations, tend to outperform the non-high performers at a, at a pretty big rate of four to one. Um, that's uh, actually on the conservative side of some of the studies I've seen, but uh, he's the most reliable as I've been using stats from him for years. Um, so your top performers are outperforming your average performers by a pretty significant margin. Um, so if you kind of look at, you know, some costs versus revenues, um, let's take uh, financials from that um, uh, study of uh, 
uh, revenue per employee and look at uh, the average revenue per employee in the financial space is about 654,000 per year. So look what it takes to recruit and where do you start making money on people? So first, you know, there's that cost to go out and recruit somebody. Uh, so you go through all of the various sources of hire you have to bring a stream of candidates into the company. Uh, you put them through the interview process, you do the background checks, any assessments or everything. All of that together, as we said, comes out to about $4,200 per employee um, that you bring on board. And uh, you can figure if uh, the employee doesn't come on board, uh, you probably you know, lose a fraction of that if they drop out somewhere in the process. Next, once you actually have that employee on board, uh, there's the cost of uh, paying them and also you're, continue, you're still training them. So usually for the first six months at least, and in most companies it's probably about a year before you get an employee up to the point where they're really being productive within the company as far as uh, bringing value. So uh, in that first year, in addition to the, what it costs to recruit the person, you're paying them some kind of a compensation. It might be um, you know, a salary plus a bonus. Um, and then you've also uh, invested quite a bit of, uh, in training them. So it might be you know, ongoing training, formal training, um, and uh, um, uh, investments, moving them around to do things. So you're probably putting in another six figures per employee if you're at a company that's uh, you know, uh, making 654000 per employee. So, you know, you put in that first year, you're looking at putting in probably 130000 140000 without getting really as much of a return on that employee. Okay, now you move into the point where, okay, that person's trained, they're on board, they're trained, you're paying them, but they're, they're out there making money for you, doing a good job. Um, so you're looking at paying them their salary plus whatever incentive you might be paying them. And then we move down to that figure, the $654,000 a year uh, per employee. So now you're starting to get a good return. So figure if it's a, you know, they're paying, you're paying them that $25,000 bonus, you've got $135,000 going into this high perform, performer. Um, and at the very minimum, you're getting, you know, four to five X return on them for their efforts. And if you factor out and multiply by that high performer matrix on the last slide, um, assuming that 20% of your organization is high performers, that means in value, a high performer is bringing in 1.6 million, whereas the average non-high performer is bringing in um, about a quarter, uh, bring in a quarter of that, about 400,000. So if you've got a high performer on board, you can see you're getting um, an incredible, you know, eight or nine times return on them. So uh, your, your focus shifts uh, in this one to really making sure that this person is incented, <clears throat> likes where they're working, wants to stay on board. Because if you can, you know, kind of look that whole process as to um, how can I get more high performers on board to start with? Um, well, the, the idea in recruiting is to get good people in and lots of people. Um, the problem often is uh, with recruiting statistics, uh, recruiting tends to stop giving um, um, statistics uh, after they get people on board. So what they'll give you is, you know, here's the number of people we brought on board. They might be able to break it down as in this graphic here and show how many came from various job sources, LinkedIn, job fairs. What you really want to get at is um, where did those high performers come from and how can you get more of them? So uh, being able to somehow kind of cross filter and say, you know, I did hire 100 people, 20 of them were high, high performers. How, where, where did I get those 20 people? And uh, let's direct our resources more at that. Uh, because if you look at some of the math, so take, for example, you have a 1,000-person you know, company um, in the finance arena. So that if the 654,000 means it's a 60, 654 million in revenues is what that company um, is, uh, is doing, if that's the, if that's the figure for a 1,000-person company. Now, if you have that 20% figure that I looked at on the last page, um, that means you got 200 people bringing in 1635 and 800 people only bringing in 408 to get to your 654 million. So it's obvious if you can increase the number of high performers within your organization, say if you move that figure up to 30% and you have 300 high performers versus uh, uh, 700 average performers, uh, just without bringing any additional people on board, but bringing in better people from the start, the revenues of the company would go up $120 million. And of course, that would continue to go up if you um, 
uh, can get on that track to where you're bringing in more high performers as opposed to average performers. Um, you know, then again, once you got those uh, high performers on board, you know, how do you keep them on board? You know, uh, this is a 200, 2018 turnover by industry. Uh, as you can see, it was almost 20% throughout all industries uh, last year. Um, but what you can see here is that the voluntary represents, uh, in most cases, two thirds to 70% of the turnover. Um, and what you'll find if you go backwards in time, even when uh, times are tough, it's really the voluntary turnover um, that varies. Um, if there's more opportunities, like there are in a hot job market right now, you're gonna see these types of turnover because um, there's just so much opportunity out there. So the focus of companies on the ability to retain these high performers uh, has gotten um, very intense. This figure came from an organization called Compensation Force. They tend to put this kind of data out every year. And it's a pretty, pretty good data. As you can see here, I've got the various industries and then down on the last uh, is um, overall through all industries. So if we're looking at the, the um, finance industry, you're still dealing with about 16 to 17% uh, um, turnover with about uh, 13 to 14% of that high performer. So again, if we go through that, uh, that same um, uh, exercise we did with the recruiting, if we look at uh, retention and um, turnover, if you have a thousand person company, and I used a round number here, 15%, uh, it means you're losing 150 employees a year if you have 15% turnover. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a kind of interesting when you turn it into real numbers. And again, let's look at it with that high performer uh, breakdown being differently. So if uh, of those 150 people you are um, losing every year, if 100 of them, two thirds, like I showed on the prior slide, are actually your high performers um, versus one third being uh, average performers or low performers that you're just cutting from the company, you know, that's $184 million walking out the door every year. Um, of course, you're recruiting to replace them, but there's a gap in there that's really uh, can be very costly. Even if you were to just flip this to say that uh, one third of those people you were letting go are high performers and two thirds of them are actually the average or non high performers, uh, then you can see there's another $60 million flip here as to how much the company can save just by keeping more high performers in the organization. Um, but you know you got to be able to find who those high performers are and um, and uh, be able to quantify and keep them. Uh, I'm not a Patriots fan, but I always found this to be the great example that uh, Drew Bledsoe was the top recruit um, for the Patriots was going to uh, reinvent the franchise, and then they had a third pick, uh, Tom Brady, a couple of years later, who eventually took over and was the uh, um, the real star in the organization. So. Once they, once they got Tom on board, they let Dead Drew go, and uh, uh, five Super Bowls later, you know, being able to retain that top performer has been uh, very beneficial for that organization. Um, so what are the things that help you retain high performers? Um, well, SAP and Oxford University actually did a study about two years ago um, and surveyed uh, about 1,000 companies as to, um, you know, what is it that high performers are looking for? And some interesting revelations and some things you might have expected that came from. Number one is, is, is compensation. Um, but it was a, a little bit more specific. It was um, compensation relative to what other people are getting paid. So you might be paying um, a software developer $100,000 a year. And, you know, since it's coming out of your pocket, your budget, you might think that's a lot of money. Um, but if everybody else in your industry is paying them $140,000 a year, um, the, uh, the developers are going to look around and eventually leave your company. Even if um, you're not aware of what's going on, there's so much um, information out there, and I'll show on this next slide, um, that, uh, you know, it's like high-priced uh, athletes. You know, they're always, like, wanting to be paid the top five in the industry. That's pretty similar with high performers in, in, in industry as well. They want to be paid at the top of their field. Uh, number two, uh, which was uh, one I didn't have on my um, radar, was actually they like to get r regular feedback. And you combine this with um, um, a competing survey, which found that 53% of managers don't provide regular feedback. They originally pretty much reserve all their feedback for the end of the year performance review and don't actually constantly tell their high performers how well they're doing or even what they can improve because uh, – um, a high performer is, as I, I like to talk about, it, they're very coachable. 
you know, they want to get better and they'll listen to anybody who can help them advance their careers and achieve more, both um, emotionally and financially. And that kind of brings to the third point is career development. Most high performers go to work somewhere not looking for a job, but they're looking for a career. And if all you treat them as is they give you service, you give them money, uh, you're going to lose them. Now, the one down here, I didn't uh, actually, uh, that's the reason I said the survey was a little surprising, uh, was that uh, I think it was in the, I couldn't find a work flexibility in the top 10 where high performers were actually uh, looking to um, work part-time at home or whatever. It seems uh, it, it might be in important to a large number of uh, employees, but it didn't register as high with high performers as uh, uh, I or you know, probably some other people reading the survey might have thought. And uh, just kind of talking about the, um, the compensation part of it, uh, the ability to um, uh, find out what your people are making versus uh, the industry is not as difficult as you might think. Um, and the reason uh, I say it is because it's uh, uh, employees are very uh, able to find this. There are published open salary surveys that are available for free on the internet. Um, they may not be the most up to date, but they're enough to rattle your employees enough to see that you know they can get twenty thousand dollars more a year if they go to work somewhere else. Uh, this is just one of the examples. Um, uh, I, I think this was a, a Robert Half study, but um, there's a lot of uh, good information out there that uh, employees can find find out whether they're being paid um, um, consistently. So. What I like to point out here is since the employees can find it, um, you as employers need to be able to go out and find this benchmark information, factor it into your um, calculations, and also be able to you know, uh, review and uh, go through it on a very regular basis. So you know um, my employee, may, employee might not be telling me that they're unhappy, um, but if I can see that they're being paid 10 to 15 percent, what uh, they could be being paid, uh, that might be something that uh, I want to proactively address rather than waiting until someone tells me they're leaving for a better offer. And so the whole goal behind all of this, of course, is to make those investments in your people, in your technology, so that you bring the best on board and you keep them, build them, and that they go and uh, provide more for the company. And that's what um, uh, we, we, we look to do with our solution. Now, what's made this um, put a little more in the hands of the employers, there's some nice, exciting new technologies uh, that are augmenting what's already out there to allow you to proactively look at what can be done to both recruit better employees and to retain them. Um, so um, in addition to a lot of the visualization tools out there, um, what uh, we've been able to do at Trend Data is uh, incorporate AI into our platform. And it does a number of different things. First of all, it provides for intelligent data gathering. And what this is, is it allows you to pull data from any source on command and bake it into one platform. You can, so you can see the most holistic and predictive results on your employees possible. You know, it could be your internal data, uh, your SAP, your ultimates, your um, um, Taleo, whatever, um, and also industry data. You want to bring in those salary surveys. You want to see what the uh, turnover rates are in industries uh, and all these things. Being able to bring all this in and it up against each other um, automatically is a key one, uh, leg one of the platform. The second is to make the solution more usable. So, you know, there's cottage industries out there for some of the bigger players, SAP and Oracle, you know, where people, you know, six months to a year it takes them to learn uh, the um, how to use solutions. A solution has got to be easy to use if people are going to um, take advantage of it. So we will we'll show you some interesting things we've done with natural language processing, which uh, uh, allows you to navigate systems uh, just like a Google search, uh, being able to type in what you want and have it uh, either bring you to the right place or build the right um, report. And then finally, probably the most um, uh, um, uh, among the most useful parts of the AI is the ability to do predictive modeling. Take that history that you have, project out into the future where you think things are going, and then be able to pull the right levers, insert at the right point so that you uh, can change the trend in a better manner for your company. And again, the great things about, about um, an AI platform is that uh, the more you do it, the, the smarter the system gets. So if you're constantly pulling data from uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics or something, or um, 
you're doing a predictive model looking at what are these three or four things, which one affects uh, turnover the most, the system is going to get to the point where you're not just modeling, you're actually um, uh, putting in the question and just getting the answer. You know, if you run a, a scenario a million times and it tells you that uh, you need to invest more in your high performers through career training rather than raises, then it's going to tell you that rather than set, let you play around with a model. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, jump out real quick and uh, just show a, a little bit of our solution here at uh, Trend Data. So as you can see, um, uh, I've got a, a dashboard for the system built onto the uh, on the screen right now, hopefully everybody can see it. So you can see there's some very um, interesting and relative uh, statistics that com combined with um, 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 monetary um, um, uh, uh, investments as well. Um, so uh, first of all, I wanted to show you where all the data comes from. So essentially, as I said, in the intelligent data gathering, you can pull information in from any solution out on the market that's available on the market. So if you're using Workday, you can take a connector, which will pipe all of that Workday data into your system uh, so that you can then go ahead and um, um, uh, use all of that to your advantage. And you can also bring it in from other sources as well. Uh, we also have an area where if uh, you want to bring in financial data, you can either input it manually or it can come in from uh, your various financial systems. So this is really where you can put in financial data that will actually show you um, you know, what is the impact of the various programs you're doing financially. Let's go back to the main dashboard and take a look. So for example, um, here's a figure up here that shows me, you know, what's the, the cost for hire uh, for my organization and also tells me how many employees I have. So uh, just looking at the employees for a second, uh, I've got 1,025 employees in my organization. If I wanted to look at that a couple of different ways, I can drill down it and it'll show me, you know, by department uh, or it might show me where they're located by state. Um, but more importantly, I want to take a look at some financial numbers. So I'm looking at this cost for hire and it tells me that it's costing me, that's not bad, it's a little best than, better than the industry average, cost me $4,000 uh, to bring someone on board. Uh, but let's look at some more, uh, more uh, uh, granular recruiting statistics. So this being my main do dashboard, I can also have a little uh, dashboard over here which might be more specific to recruiting. So as I pop over here, I see I still have my cost per hire metric, but I also have a few things that tell me, for example, the average time to fill an open position. Again, there, it looks like I'm doing a little better than the averages. And I can, again, drill down by that and see it by department if I want. It shows me um, uh, all of my departments are pretty much around that figure, but maybe private wealth uh, takes a little bit longer, about eight days. And that might be something I might want to address within the uh, organization. But... Um, Let's look at, uh, look at this source of hire, kind of what we, we referenced a little bit in the presentation where I have um, all the different areas I am I'm recruiting people from. And this is a metric. So this is just showing me the last time snap, which happens to be a month. So last month I got 36% of my hires from job boards. And I also got about 18, 19% from uh, 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 LinkedIn. Uh, let's move from uh, drill down to analytics and see if that's any kind of a pattern is in that area. So if I do the analytics, what it's going to do is, is give me um, over the last 12 months what's been going on in my um, um, in hiring. And as you can see, it looks pretty consistent that um, the number of people I'm getting from job boards, uh, except for maybe one month here, uh, is the most uh, common source. And down below, you can also get a look at all of the people who are in the current view that you're looking at, new hires that have come into the company. Um, I can look at this a number of different ways. If I wanted to see it, say, um, in multiple years and go back five years, I can do that. Um, and I can also look at it as percentage of my hires as opposed to just raw numbers. So as you can see, um, when you aggregate everything, uh, job boards is the, is the top um, uh, uh, source for hire. But what about high performers? So what I can do then is actually do, as I showed in the, the presentation, is drill down a little bit and show um, where am I getting my high performers from. So going back a few years, um, you know, I've done performance reviews on several of these people. If I, if I clicked off um, the uh, low performing scores, and in my organization, fours and fives are the high performance scores, uh, what I can show, at least in years past, um, the people who've gotten the highest performance scores, uh, 2017 and back, are from LinkedIn. And uh, in 
a couple of the years also employee referrals has come above job boards, although job boards seems to have made a recovery here in 2018. But what this might tell me is that I need to um, start investing maybe a little bit more in LinkedIn if I'm putting all my money into job boards right now. And this can show me perhaps where uh, um, uh, if I put more money into LinkedIn, I'll start getting that higher amount of uh, high performers. So let me go back to the, the dashboard again here and let's look at a couple other financial driven areas. Uh, let's talk about compensation. Um, suppose I wanted to look at compensation uh, throughout my organization, uh, but be specific about it. So rather than just overall, if I wanted to look at what is average compensation, and you can see the um, the um, uh, the system kind of fills out the uh, uh, what you're looking for with the natural language. And as I narrow it down, and if I want to look at it by uh, say job job level, um, it's going to narrow down really to me and I can click on this question. And once I uh, go on that, it's going to show me um, what I pay on average to my directors, uh, what I pay on average to my EVPs and my vice presidents and all across uh, the various uh, levels I put in the organization for job level. Now, if I want to go a little more with that and bring in some industry data, I can do that. This is, shows the uh, intelligent data gathering. So if I go, what is the average compensation uh, by uh, job level, uh, but compared to industry average, you'll notice it'll keep the, um, uh, the uh, 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 levels by um, job level, but it's gonna populate another bar right next to it, which will show um, in my industry, am I paying my directors, vice presidents, and everybody uh, akin to what uh, my competitors are paying? And from this, it looks like I'm doing pretty well as far as um, uh, uh, paying my people um, according to um, industry averages. Now, if this is something I want to keep looking at, I can actually save it to my dashboard um, and name it. And once I press save, it'll now be on my dashboard and updated uh, whenever I whenever I want to be able to do that. So I can uh, move this uh, over here, spread it out, and now I've got. Um, this is one of my standard metrics on my dashboard. Now this um, actually is showing um, uh, navigated to a metric that was in the system. What if I wanna get a little more granular and show what impact has uh, giving uh, raises had on performance of my employees? Now this is something that might take a little more analysis of the system. So what I can do is uh, type in a question, say show employees by performance change by a uh, previous raise. Okay, so what this is gonna do is you'll see when I uh, click this, actually goes out and creates a brand new metric for me. And what you're seeing here is that um, uh, the people who got an average of a 3.09% raise actually went down in productivity. So you gave those people a raise and they actually did worse than they did the year before. The people you gave an average of 5.4%, they actually didn't change at all. And it was really only the people you gave a really high raise to 8% plus that actually went up in their um, uh, uh, ability to actually uh, that performed better. Um, and if you wanted to, you've got a lot of people over here that might be new hires. If I wanted to narrow this down and say with um, a previous raise not empty, um, it'll actually refine the graph a little bit more and just show me this. And if I wanted to take this, for example, and put it on my dashboard, I could as well. Um, so what I've shown you so far is the, um, the present uh, and the past. Now, what about the future? That's the last part of the AI um, offering, the predictive modeling. Well, you can see right here, I've got a metric on my dashboard that shows turnover. And right now it's showing voluntary versus involuntary turnover uh, for the last six months. Let me look at that one a little bit more in detail and see you know, why people are voluntarily leaving the company. And as you can see, it's expanded to like an entire year. And uh, we can see going back uh, to November of last year, I've had a really disproportionate, even more so than the industry average as far as how people leaving my company voluntarily. Now let's see who are those people. Maybe I don't want to look at it voluntary versus involuntary. What if I want to look at it by performance? 
um, are those voluntary people who are leaving high performers. So when I change the, the graph, you can see, yes, in fact, they are. Um, starting in January, a um, couple of months in the beginning of the year, I've started losing high performers at an alarming rate uh, going all the way up. Again, I could look at this as a percentage versus as a average. And what it'll show me is, uh, again, my high performer turnover rate has not only gotten to the same as the rest of the company, but now has actually sur surpassed and is very high, um, almost double what it is in non-high performers. Is there any reason for that? Well, there's a couple of things we can look at. I can look at uh, this events overlay, uh, which um, will put events on the line and say, well, I had an um, acquisition last year. Uh, often uh, what drives high performers out is sometimes uh, when you acquire a company, a new layer of management comes in and um, it kind of blocks the, um, uh, the promotion possibilities of some of your high performers. Um, let's go in and see if we do a predictive model, if that actually is panning out. So I click on the predictive here, and what it's going to do is move me to the future. So this shows me the last six months of escalating turnover, and this shows me where turnover is going to get to and uh, do for the next six months. Now, it looks like it's going to go up and then kind of escalate to right about here and then start uh, tapering down a bit. Um, and if I do again, you know, show that by high performer and non-high performer, uh, shows an even more alarming trend is that uh, it's the high performers are going to stay almost at that two to one level. So we've got some work to do here. if We want to keep our company strong and keep our best people on board. So I showed you down below where I had the individual uh, summaries for each um, employee. I can actually move this to a summary view. And what it's going to do is give me a lot of figures that are affected by turnover. Um, you know, how much a lot of those investment statistics, how much am I investing in salary? Uh, what am I letting people work from home? Am I investing in training for some of my high performers? And also the breakdown of uh, you know, who's turning over high performers versus non-high performers. So if I uh, look at this modeling, I can uh, click on here. And as we can see, uh, November is kind of projected to have a high performer turnover uh, hit about 9%, which is very alarming. Uh, so what can I do to change that? Well, first of all, I can go and look at uh, giving people more money. Um, so right now you see um, total turnover is about 5.6 and high performers projected to be about 9.4. So what if I gave everybody, say, um, an average of $5,000 raise and increase, increase this to 148? Well, you can see that uh, it barely made a dent into the total turnover and the high turnover. Both went down just a fraction. So a thousand person company, $5,000 an employee. I just invested $5 million and got uh, mostly nothing for it. So maybe I won't do that. I'll back that out. Um, now look at my remote employees. Looks like the company has a pretty aggressive uh, policy for letting um, uh, employees work from home. Uh, what if I increase that and let another 10% work from home and move this to, say, 45? Uh, you can see that had a good effect on the overall turnover rate, which went down about <clears throat> um, about a point point one point two percent but it's the high performers that are still uh, you know, at that two to one margin. So maybe, um, maybe I leave that in if it's uh, something that the company can afford to do uh, personnel wise, if it doesn't cost that much. But look at this high performers in professional development. So even uh, starting with the uh, acquisition uh, a few years ago, it looks like we've really skimped down on how much we've been spending on our high performers. Less than 7% of my high performers are in any kind of professional development program. Um, and it doesn't look like, uh, based on past rates, the company's going to increase that at all. So maybe um, I see what happens if I put the money there instead of in uh, salary or compensation increases, and I shoot that up to 115. Ah, well, you can see that really starts to have an effect on the um, high preferred turnover, and the AI engine tells you that, uh, Yes, that's a very good investment. You need to start spending more money on that. It's recommending that we increase it uh, by 10% over the next uh, five months. So it's a good example of showing, you know, using past history and uh, um, the metrics and finance that you've invested in the company, what you can do to actually improve um, your situation and keep your high performers and keep that company's bottom line going. So um, with that, I'm going to go back to the uh, presentation here and um, open it up for questions. Now, if, if you uh, have a question, if you could send it in by the chat, 
um, uh, since we've got a lot of people on board and I don't want to, um, uh, you know, have any static or anything. So uh, let's, uh, let's open it up for questions. Um, I got a few here that just came in and also some from yesterday. Um, it asks about the, the, the natural language processing and the modeling, if, if that's something that's offered in the base product of trend data. The natural language processing is, it's uh, basically just another navigable way to get through the system and create new metrics and analytics. Uh, the natural language, however, uh, we have to configure that per client because um, not everybody's going to be using the same factors and your data is going to be a, a little different. So we, um, so we do um, usually come in and do an engagement for that to kind of look at your data and also build out the model correctly. Um, can we include uh, uh, other finance and HR data? Um, yeah, so the, the, the ones that I showed there in the data sources were just examples. Um, we can pull data in from any source that you have available, um, either um, uh, automated file feed or if the system has an API, we can load that in. Uh, we can build a real-time integration. So, yeah, wherever your data is coming from, we can pull it into the system. It, it's not that difficult. Um, sort of along those questions are very specific. Can we connect to iSIMS, the recruiting system? Absolutely. Uh, they're among the top uh, recruiting systems in the industry. We definitely connect to them. Um, and there's a question that asked, you know, where did I get the salary data that I used for the demo? Um, we actually access some free services out there. I mentioned uh, Robert Half. Um, they publish a report every year that um, uh, goes by industry and gives you pretty detailed data as to some of the average salaries within various organizations. Um, but if you want a lot of real-time uh, stuff that's, you know, updated much more often, uh, you can bring it in from salary.com or um, Mercer and Aon, a few of those other organizations have some, some really good salary data. Um, so, um, you know, it's a good place to uh, to go and look for data. Um, let me see, do I have any uh, other questions? Okay. Well, if that's if that's the uh, the end of it, um, I would like to um, uh, thank you all for um, uh, participating today. Um, if you want to uh, contact me or follow me on any social medias, that's my email, Tom at trenddata.com. My Twitter is at Tom McEwen, and uh, my blog is published at TomMcEwen.net. Uh, if you want to reach out to Trend Data, get a further demonstration, or discuss maybe uh, uh, making use of our product, just uh, email marketing at trenddata.com. And you can follow us at, uh, on Twitter at, at trenddatainc, um, and our website is trenddata.com. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank everybody for attending. I hope you got something out of this. As I said, we've recorded the session, so if any of your colleagues were unable to make it, we'll be posting this on our website probably in the next uh, three or four days after we've uh, gotten the recording down, loaded and everything. So appreciate your time and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you.